Well, greetings, dear friends, in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you once again on our Wednesday night Bible classes. And we have had recently a few interruptions in these, trying to update equipment and so forth, but uh, we're beginning to get back in the order of our regular classes, and it's just a joy to have you with us and you who are part of these Wednesday night classes, uh, both the ones that, uh, that, that I teach and the ones that uh, Brother Raven Bird teaches. We're looking at uh, the feasts of the Lord as set forth in Israel. And we're looking at the Day of Atonement. We're looking at the Feast of the Seventh Month. Everything of the testimony of Christ, which is the testimony of our salvation in Christ, all of those things involving the testimony of our salvation, and I repeat, the testimony of Christ, are gathered up in the Feast of the Seventh Month. The Feast of Tabernacles, and that begins with the blowing the day, the Feast of the Day of the Blowing of the Trumpet. And we looked at that for several sessions. And now we're looking at the Day of Atonement. The blowing of the trumpet was to awaken Israel and draw Israel together throughout the whole land unto this Day of Atonement. So that's what we've been looking at, not, not so much in a historical way. Of course, you have to consider the history of it, and by that I mean as it is laid out in the Scripture, as, as it was enacted uh, in Israel. Uh, that's the history part of it. Uh, but all of that history ends with the cross and the fulfillment of all of that history never ceases, never ends. Because that fulfillment is in Christ. Now many will say, in teaching these, these same feasts, many will say that, uh, I think in, in, in fact in the notebook that I have here, uh, which is a, a notebook that I've been looking at for some of the historical background, uh, many will say that the fulfillment is in Christ and the church. And then they look at they look at the church today or they look at Christian religion today and failing to see what they think they should see then they begin to say, well, these feasts have not yet been fulfilled. Well, they have all been fulfilled in Christ. Hun, they were all given as a testimony of Christ in the first place. And all of these feasts find their substance, their reality, their fulfillment in Christ now. And that very Christ is our salvation. There may be believers who are genuinely born again, in whom Christ genuinely dwells, who have not come to comprehend Him as their salvation in the way that He has set forth in these feasts. Nonetheless, he is that very salvation. As I was just saying that, I was thinking of Paul's 
of Paul's reasoning with the church, with those to whom he was writing the epistle, particularly 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he was reasoning with them concerning the resurrection. Evidently, a good number of them did not believe in the resurrection period. Some perhaps who had believed in a resurrection were beginning to be doubtful. Anyway, there was a great dispute going over, uh, going around concerning the resurrection, and Paul jumps right into the middle of it. But he doesn't dispute the historical doctrine of the resurrection. And I won't go any further on that, but he doesn't, he doesn't dispute what the Sadducees are teaching over against the Pharisees and those over against others in the Sanhedrin and those over against, here at least, just the concept of the heathen out from which all of the Corinthians uh, came. No, he cuts right to the bone and he says, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead, seeing that Christ, seeing that we preach Christ raised up. And then he goes on with his reasoning, and he says, if, if what you say is true, if there be no resurrection of the dead, now I'm saying, if, if people are saying, or some are saying, well, uh, there is no fulfillment yet, of the Feast of Atonement, not full, not real, not complete. The church hasn't gone into their part of the fulfillment. Part of it's got to be fulfilled in the church. And they go on and on, and then they'll talk about the, the tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, which we'll come to, and that hasn't been fulfilled. And there's arguments about that. That was the, what Paul was facing over the resurrection. And he talks to him about that, and finally he says... And it's just like he's saying, you know, I'm tired of arguing with you. I'm tired of all of the theories. I'm tired of all of your historical teachings. The fact of the matter is Christ is now raised up out from among the dead. And he is now become the first fruits of all those who receive him. And he just ends the argument, and then he begins to very forcefully teach Christ the resurrection and showing the church to be the body of that resurrection. And it isn't something that has to be fulfilled in the church. It was fulfilled in Christ, whose body the church is. It was fulfilled in Christ, because Christ lives in the believer. So he just brought his argument, as it were, into the reality of who Christ is. And that's what we've been doing here in these, in these studies concerning these feasts. Now, there is that historical part. Yeah, the type and the shadow, the laying out of it. But it was given as a testimony of God to Israel concerning His Son. And if you, if you fail to understand that, oh, well, hon, there is no way you can understand any part of that historical Testimony. How are you going to understand anything about the Lamb used of Israel in history, in the Old Testament, even in coming out of Egypt? How, how are it, un, unless you see that Lamb now fulfilled in Christ, then how much sense does that whole story really make? None. Absolutely none. None.
And there's a lot of argument in the Christian world today about the significance of that lamb. That's the truth, folks. And of course, in Judaism today, you know, the significance of that lamb is yet to be fulfilled in their minds and their hearts. Both Judaism and a lot of teaching in Christianity have totally missed the point that it was the testimony of the one Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who not only brought all of these things into himself at the cross, who not only came forth in the power of the resurrection that Paul exclusively deals with in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Not only that, but is himself the substance, the living substance of everything that he fulfilled, all the types and all of the shadows. He is far, far above all that he fulfilled because he existed before it. It was simply a shadow of what existed from the very beginning and before the foundation of the world. And it could never have been fully set forth as a manifestation in any of the types and shadows. No bulls, no goats, no lambs, no turtle doves, none of that. Nor even the priesthood, nor even the altars, nor even the tabernacle, nor even the temple. All of those things were temporal and they were signs. And they were as promises, they were shadows. They were shadows. They're called shadows because they were shadows of something that was real, that had substance. It takes something that has substance to even cast a shadow. And it's a shame that most, that too many, too many Christians today, and in Christianity today, are still looking to the shadow of the thing rather than finding the substance of the thing in Christ himself. All right, that's, that's our little sermon. I want us to continue to look at the reality of our reconciliation, the atonement, and the reconciliation, that's what this day was. The day of atonement was to be kept from even, evening to evening. The same truth is applicable here for uh, the other feast days and Sabbath days. Israel had to cease from their own works and rest in the work of the atonement had to cease from their own works and rest in the work of the atonement. My, my. I want to talk about that in a minute. I, I want to talk about that right there in a minute. Israel had to cease from their own works and rest in the work of the atonement. My, my. It is that work of the atonement that I want to talk with you about. It is that work of the reconciliation that I want to talk with you about. Just now. What Christ did at the cross 
in his death, burial, resurrection, in the completeness of it, the completeness of it, the finality of it, once, once, once. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 9. You can turn there if, if where you are, you have your Bibles or uh, whatever. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 9 uh, today and probably for several Wednesdays to come because it's all laid out here. Uh, the reconciliation is laid out here. The more I look at Hebrews 9 in the last two or three months, uh, everything that seemingly everything that I can find relating to our union with Christ is here, is, is set forth here in Hebrews 9. And, and, and the Lord is always the appearing of it. I mean, the Lord appears as what? Well, He appears as who He is. And He is everything of our salvation. Salvation. Oh yes, the atonement of it, the reconciliation of it, the righteousness of it. My God, hon. The redemption of it. He's everything of it. He's everything of it. No wonder Paul said, oh, that I may know him. And he's not talking there about an initial encounter with Christ that he had already had years and years and years before he made that statement in his letter to the Philippians. No, he's talking about a continual knowing of him beyond the natural horizon, certainly of our natural minds, and even to the broadening of our horizons in the learning of Christ and having formed in us the mind of Christ. Oh, yes, yes, to know Him. Personally, I believe there is truly made manifest the love of God. Love involves knowing one another, the knowing of one of another. Loving involves that. And it is the knowing of Him wherewith and whereby the love of God, which is Christ, is shed abroad in our hearts. I think it even comes to the incense that was on this altar because this feast we're talking about is where the high priest went behind the veil one time a year carrying the burning incense in the golden in the golden vial, carrying it with him behind and at the veil, and of course the incense is is in its fullest intent. The incense is the savor, the savor of the knowledge of Christ, the sweet savor of Christ, of the knowledge of Christ. Paul tells us that. He tells us that. He says that that is that we may be wherever at all times and in all places that we may be there. God maketh of us there, maketh manifest by us, excuse me, not of us, there, the savor of the knowledge of Christ. And that it is death to some, life to others, but unto God it is the sweet-smelling savor of His Son. Oh, and it's the savor of love. It's the savor of love. And more and more I see it's the high priest who entered in, and he entered in in the savor of love. Christ did that too, except He did it perfectly, perfectly presenting his body, his blood, his self before the Father. Perfect love. Perfect love. You're not going to find that kind of love in anyone else except in him, hon. And it is in the knowing of him that that becomes a sweet smelling savor. Not, not, not the savor of sweating flesh, not the savor of our efforts to be Him, to be something that He is, to do or not to do, 
No, none of that. Rest. See, this is the day of rest. Well, Christ is the day of rest. But I, I just want us to look at it here in a moment concerning that finished work. And I say here in a moment, if we don't get to it today, we'll get to it the next class. What I wanted to say is the finished work, what he finishes, is actually who he is dwelling in you. What he hath finished, he himself now is in you. Well, what is finished? Uh, among so many things, Adam crucified, the whole Adamic creation put away. We'll look at all of these later. The consummation of the age, that is the end of the world, the end of the old covenant world. And it was for Israel the end of the world. I mean, the thing might as well blew, blew up. Literally, the sun may as well have fell out of the sky and the blood literally turned to moon and bled all over the planet and all of the stars come crashing down into the ocean because figuratively that's exactly what happened at the cross, honey. It was literally, absolutely abolished in the heart and in the mind of the Father through the death of the Son that world came to an end. And along with it, the Adamic creation. Oh yeah. The consummation of the age in which God related to man through natural, material, temporal, shadows and types. Sin, everything that fell short, is judged here, put away from God. It is finished here at the cross. I want to say something clearly. God has given to you and to me nothing to finish. He hasn't given us a salvation and said, well, I made a good start on this. And I think now, through my direction, you should be able to bring it about. If you work hard, stay at it, you can get it finished. That's not what happened. Everything finished in the sun. Everything finished in the sun. Let me, let, me, let me look here again so I don't run by something that I wanted to say, but everything here finished in the sun. Well, oh yeah, here it is written right down here. The finished work is not only what was and is taken away at the cross. In other words, it's not, it's not only that which came to its, to its end in that it was put away. Those things that all fell short. It's not just that that came to its end. And you see, some to some coming to the end was an abolishment, put in a way. The others coming to its end was finding its fulfillment 
and its very substance coming to its goal, coming to its completement. The finished work is also that, honey. The finished work is not what is just on sometimes, well, I think back behind me here, there may be a cross. It's not important right now. The diagram isn't. But we'll do a cross and we'll put the old on one side and the new on the other side. Well, hon, he is the finished work of both sides. And I want you to realize that. I want you to realize that as completely he abolished the first, so just that completely he made perfect the second. Again, I'm compelled to say, oh, that I may know him. That in seeing him, the perfect, that which is yet in part in my understanding, in my heart, in my concept, in my comprehension and laying hold, may be done away. Put away with the coming. And I don't mean the coming of the perfect to be in me is in me now, but with his coming forth in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. The word coming as it is used there, allowing himself to be seen, opening the eyes of my very soul and heart to who he is. That's what I'm talking to you about. Hun, my Lord God, that's what the Scripture is talking to all of us about. The cross did a finished work, and that finished work is Christ. That finished work is Christ. All right, reconciliation. Just how completely reconciled are we to God? How completely reconciled are we by and with and in Christ? Well, hon, the end, the goal, the completeness of our reconciliation is having no life but Christ. That is so now. Galatians 2, 19 through 21, that's what it's all about. Paul saying there that he has come to the very end of the law in Christ. Verse 19, that's what he's really saying there. I mean, read it to us. Maybe we need to. I don't know whether we're going to get <laughs> to look at Hebrews 9 or not, but everything I'm saying fits in either verse 24 or it fits in verse 25, 6, and 7 or it fits in verse 28, and we'll be looking at all of these. But look at Galatians. Look at Galatians. What are we talking about? We're talking about reconciliation. And to do that, we, we, need to, uh, we need to look at Romans 5 and just read something there. Now, we've read Romans 5 several times, but I want to do that just to, maybe, maybe you've forgotten it, maybe, maybe you weren't in that particular session. 
In Romans 5, Paul is talking about uh, reconciliation. And then he brings that right into chapter 6 where he, where he actually shows the reality of that reconciliation. Uh, and, and, and then he goes on into Romans 7 showing how it was the answer to the Jew as well as to the Gentile who would, who would receive it. That bleeds over into Romans 8 right there in the very first few verses, and then it just keeps on going. And though it is Christ, and though, I mean, there's a, there's a whole new creation of things that we see in the face of Jesus Christ. Reconciliation is one of them. And that's what I'm talking to you about just now. It's not the only thing that you're going to see in Romans 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, but there's only one thing you are going to see there, and that's Christ. There's only one thing we are going to see in, in Hebrews 9, and that's Christ. But in Him, honey, dwelleth all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Come on. <laughs> Wake up. Smell the rose of Sharon. It's all in Him, darling. My, my, my. And none other than the Father by His eternal Spirit. Reveals that reality in the very person of His Son, Christ in you. My Lord, have mercy. What a thrill, what a joy. That, see, this stuff is alive, hon. It's never dead. It's never dead theology. It's never, it never becomes historical. The knowing of Christ never becomes historical. We don't have to look back to last year, last month, last week. No, no, no. No, it's now, right now ongoing right now. It's alive. It's alive or it doesn't exist at all. And it's the resurrection who lives in you. And we're not talking about soulish activities or physical activities either. Not at all. Romans 5, verse 8, God commended His love toward us. See what I tell you? It's that love goes behind the veil, does away with the veil. In that, well, we yet sinners, Christ died for us. But see, Christ died for us. My Lord, what that brings, that brings a whole complete finished work of God into it. It's not just seeing somebody hanging on some cross timbers, breathing his last breath. No, there's much, that's the, the death of Christ, the death of the cross, the death of humanity, the end of the world, that age coming completely to an end. Out of that, a resurrection who is the Son of God, not simply the Son of God being raised up, yes, but who is He? He is the resurrection and the life. My Lord, hon. So you can't just read this nonchalantly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh my. Much more. <laughs> and all that is gathered up into that death, our reconciliation. How are we reconciled? He brings us to death. He puts us to death. He puts us away. Much more than being now justified. How? By His blood. 
Now, that's not because we've got a little blood smeared on us somewhere. Come on, hon. The whole thing is his death, what he poured out. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, here's where he really gets down to it. And then we're going to Galatians 2. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved, made whole, by His life. Now, this is exactly what Paul is talking about in Ephesians, the second chapter. If you haven't been with us when we read these, then you can, you can read Ephesians 2 carefully, starting with about verse 10 if you want to, and go all the way through the end of it, and you will see how he reconciled both Jew and Gentile, not just to one another, that wasn't the point. He reconciled both Jew and Gentile unto himself through, through the body of the death of Jesus Christ, through the body of the cross. He gathered them up in one body, put both of them to death in one death, and came forth in the power of his resurrection as one new man, being not Jew, not Gentile, but one new man, who is the Lord from heaven. And it is the Lord from heaven living in me and living in you. That is the goal. That is the E-N-D. That's the farthest extension, the farthest, the most utmost thought of God concerning my, my reconciliation and your reconciliation is having none but His Son living in me. You can't take reconciliation beyond that. Because there is nothing beyond that. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. And, and it's significant that he's saying that to these folks here, the Galatians, why? Because they've just recently decided to become Judaizers. I mean, they, they didn't go back to the law. They, they went where they'd never been before. They received the law in place of that salvation, the fullness of which is Christ himself. You know that. Read that book. But look, and Paul is using himself because they know him. He was there. He's the one who, was, who set forth the gospel in their midst for the very first time from their beginning. Paul was there. And so he uses himself. He certifies his gospel. He certifies how his gospel was given. He certifies right on down the line. And now, he uses himself in Galatians 2.20, verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. What is he saying? He's saying exactly what we'll find in a little more, in, in, in a little enlargement uh, in, in Hebrews 9. The end, the end of the law is come with Christ. The end is come. Huh. Oh, my Lord and my God. And I'm telling you again, honey, he's the end to, if you can hear this, to both sides. He's the end. He's the end of that which was old and had to be put away. He is the end of the new, the endlessness of it, the glory of it, the majesty of it, the completement and the perfection of it. That's him, darling. That's him. And he lives in you. 
Oh, that I may know him. That my soul may bask in the light of his glory. That my heart, that my heart may receive the very faith of the indwelling love of God, that, that the love may be shed abroad. That's the activity I'm talking about, not the works of the flesh, but the working of the Spirit of God in our souls. While our soul itself has found rest. Here, to me, and I think this is what I got off on this by reading a while ago to, on one of my notes here, that to me, the definition of reconciliation is found clearly and it is stated clearly in Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. I really believe that if we could look deeply into this, if, 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 if we could in our knowing the Lord If we could look, I am crucified with Christ. Knowing that He is fully our life. Paul wrote it knowing that. But you remember it because I keep going to Philippians. Because there's where Paul is still pressing, still reaching, still knowing. Lord God Almighty. His head was severed from his body while he was yet knowing. And I'm sitting here in front of you on this camera while he is yet knowing. Honey, none of this ceases with the death of your physical body. None of it. <laughs> and yet it does become the very government the very government by which we live even in this oh yes and most certainly in this physical body. I am crucified. I think this speaks of the fellow Ship of his sufferings. Now see, no, 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 I'm not talking about somebody nailing you up on a post somewhere with a hammer and big nails. And I'm not talking about bad luck and terrible things happening and all that kind of stuff either. No, it's something else. It's something else, but it brings about a brokenness. It brings about a brokenness. And it brings about a rest. It, it brings about a sureness and a certainty that it is not I, but Christ who liveth in me me. Well, I thought I'd mention that because I think the two are connected here if we really look deeply enough. Crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. And there's the whole principle of the Sabbath. And there is the whole reality of the rest not 
high. Oh, hon. We can't just make this a verse, darling. It wasn't a verse with Paul. He didn't read that somewhere. He wrote it out from a God-given, Spirit-revealed reality that was governing his pen at the time this letter was written. And it was governing before he wrote this letter, before he knew that the Galatians were even or even where they were, before he ever found them. Not I. See, hon, that's the reconciliation. And the much more than not I. Oh my, yes, but much more. Christ liveth in you. That's what Romans 5 said. Made whole by his life. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Reconciled by his death. Not I. See? See how many ways that works? That works because it is... Because now I can be accepted of God in the Beloved, which we're going to look at in verse 24 of Romans 9 uh, in time to come. Yes. Accepted in the Beloved. When you read that verse, because most people that I've heard talk about that over the years, you know, it, it, it's kind of a me and Jesus type thing. Me and Jesus. But with the Father, it's just a Jesus type thing. Now, I truly hope you can hear this because this is a reality that we, that we, we receive this reality in new birth. When we're born again, let me put it this way, this is the reality of which we are born of God. At some point, hon, in the dealing of the Spirit, we're going to have to walk in this reality in that very inward way, and the reality is full and complete. understand? Not I. On the one hand, I am reconciled to God, not I, by the death of the Son, crucified with Christ. And the Father knows you and I in His Son. Those who are born of His Son. That's talking about much more we shall be saved by His life. That's Christ in you. That's Christ living in you. That's Christ Born from above. Whatever you want to call it. It's Christ in you. It is new birth. Born again. Born from above. Born anew. Jesus saying, I will come anew. <laughs> I will be in you. Hallelujah. Not I. How does that relate to me? That's how it relates to God. He sees us in the Son. Accepts us in the Son as having no life but the Son. But we'll get really clear on this in verse 24 as we go there. Hebrews 9. 
But on the other side, not really so much on the other side, but point number two. With me, it is eternal rest. Not I, but Christ, hon, is Sabbath rest. Not I, but Christ. <laughs> See, it's more than me just trying to curtail, curtail some things of the flesh or everything that is of the flesh or, you know, just go on and on and on and on and on trying to figure out what's the flesh and how should I not do it and what is the flesh and how can I stay away from it and, and then what's this and what's, what's bad and how can I not do it, what's good and how can I manage to do that, all of that. There's something more complete than me doing or not doing. There's something more complete. What is that? Not I. Dead. Crucified with Christ. I do believe, hon, that the revealing of that reality in my soul, in the very person of that reality, the Lord Jesus Christ, brings me into a fellowship with the Son of God that I could never know or partake of any other way. It surely is the fellowship of eating His flesh and drinking His blood. It surely is always being in remembrance of me. Because that's not talking about how we remember something in, as a historical fact. No, it is a present reality. I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, but not I. There's fellowship there, hon. And there... is the goal of reconciliation, being at peace with God, well, Christ is our peace. Where, where, <laughs> where there is but one who liveth, and that one being the Prince of Peace, there is peace. There's no struggle in my soul. For the knowing of Christ is an ever ongoing reality. And we enter into that rest like we enter in to light. And the knowing of Him. So what is the apex of it all? What is the grand definition of this day of atonement? What is it from the viewpoint of the Father and on the part of the Father and, and established by the Father? What is it? Christ liveth. Christ liveth. Like as the Son was raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father. See, Christ liveth. Even so, we to walk in newness of life. That's his life. That's his life. What do we do, hon? We come into the Father's... We come into a salvation that is full and complete. And I wanted to say we come into the Father's view. Well, I can say that if you understand that the view of the Father is the view of divine truth, it is the view of divine completement, it is the view 
of who he is. It is the view of the truth as the truth is both revealed and made manifest in Christ. We have come to such a reconciliation, hon. And in this last verse, verse 21, Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. See? For if righteousness came by the law, any works of the flesh, I do not frustrate the grace of God. How would we frustrate the grace of God? By thinking that we have a life other than Christ, a life of our own. Oh, you can put it in any kind of a suit that you want to put it in, paint it any color, give it any kind of a doctrine. But hun, I was going to just say something to you here. I may not be able to find stuff that I write down. Do you realize that everything that everywhere it is still me living for him that I frustrate the grace of God. Rather, and it's not just a, a play on words either. It is it is an understanding given of God concerning our reconciliation in His death and our life, our salvation in His life. So we may want to understand and set our heart to know and make it a matter of prayer. Father, let me see salvation in this way. Let me see Christ in this way. Bring me to understand that Christ was both my death and my burial before he was my life. But that is the order of the cross and that is the order of spiritual reality. When one died, all died. When we were baptized into him, it was that very death into which we were submerged. 
but it was through union with Him. And why? So that like as Christ was raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. I'm not talking about anything that is subsequent to our salvation because it is all one work of the Spirit of God. But hon, you can't skip over, go around the cross and just accept the life. Colossians 2.20, If then you died with Christ. Colossians 3.3, 3, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Romans 6, 3. Do you not know that all of us, as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death, buried with Him by baptism through death? Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. On and on and on. And we're not talking about anything subsequent. We're talking about an order of our salvation. Was Christ raised up before he died? No. Is he our life before he was our death? No. What are you talking about, brother? I'm, I'm talking about reconciliation. In the view of God, one ends in the other. But I know in the teaching of so many of, of Christianity today and the doctrinal issues, that isn't true. The death has been looked over and the point is said that, well, he dies so we wouldn't have to die and God, you know, through the death of Christ, God just reconciled all of us back into himself. No, honey, it was through that death, in that death, we are reconciled by His death. And we're joined together with Him in His death that He may be the one who lives in us. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. That is the end of reconciliation. And it's what this whole feast of atonement was all about. And we'll, we'll look a little farther into it in our next class. The Lord bless. Good to have you with us in these Wednesday night searchings and these Wednesday night sharings. Let us hear from you. If you have questions, if there's some way we can be a ministry to you, reach out to you, please let us know. And may the Lord richly bless you. We look forward to seeing you next time. Amen.